actual uh, speech itself. So in 2013, we're facing into an important decade of centenaries. That as Ruan mentioned, is going to take us everything from the Home Rule crisis right up until the end of the Civil War. And as we face into this decade again, as Ruan mentioned, there is um, a need to kind of redefine and reassess some of the period of the Irish Revolution. And for too long, it is a period that has, if you will pardon the pun, been presented in black and white. One of the things this book allowed me to do was explore some of the grey areas, and as well as going through the whole narrative of the period, pick out specific incidents that again might, might make people think and reassess the, the history we were taught in school. Uh, within the traditional narrative, there are myths that need to be challenged. We were often told in, in history books that Tomás McCartan, the mayor of Cork, was murdered or assassinated or killed, choose your own word, by Englishmen in the Black and Tans, when it turns out that his killers were in fact all Irish members of the Royal Irish Constabulary. So this period isn't as, as simple as, as English versus Irish. Um, we're often told about the role of patriot priests, and yes, there were some very patriotic clergymen in this period, but they were often in a minority. Um, and whilst the emphasis has always been on the question of national independence, we have tended to overlook the other things that were going on at the time. Uh, the struggle for women's rights, the struggle for social change, the birth of trade unionism, the lockout, ideas about socialism mixed in there with more conservative ideas of national independence and, and with a kind of liberal republicanism as well. Uh, now discussion of Irish involvement in the First World War is firmly in the public domain at the moment. And it is right that that aspect of Irish history should be acknowledged, but it should not be commemorated uncritically. The heroic narrative that Irishmen fought in the war to secure home rule is oversimplistic. While some Irishmen were undoubtedly uh, motivated to fight in that war because they believed that what they were doing was patriotic and they believed in what politicians said about the political things this would achieve, um, the narrative so far has tended to overlook the many others, and possibly even the majority, who enlisted to escape from poverty and unemployment, or who enlisted due to social pressure, in a spirit of adventure, or because they believed invented stories about supposed German atrocities that were printed in the press. Nor should Irish involvement in the First World War come at the expense of those who remained in Ireland to fight and to work directly for Irish independence. Now in November uh, we're going to have ceremonies all over the country and a lot of press reports about the 93rd anniversary of uh, the end of the First World War and Irishmen in the trenches and again as I said it's right that should be remembered. But why then in July was the 90th anniversary of the truce which ended our war of independence almost completely unmarked? To my knowledge, there are only two local, uh, local events that were organised to commemorate specifically the truce of the 11th of July 1921. And that's an important event in our history and it should not be overlooked. Unfortunately, many of those so far who have claimed that they were attempting to set the historical record straight have been agenda-driven and politically motivated. There has been a deliberate attempt by revisionist historians to propagate an idea that the Republican campaign during the War of Independence was motivated almost entirely by sectarianism. And in an attempt to prove this, a number of revisionist historians have ignored valid evidence that contradicts their findings. They have instead, in some cases, relied on anonymous resources, questionable interpretation of historical documents, and in one or two cases, possible fraud. A number of newspaper columnists have seized on these spurious claims and publicised them. These same columnists put themselves forwards as authorities on the 1913-23 to 23 period of the revolution, yet I have never encountered any of them when I visited an archive and I spend a lot of time there. I'm not aware of any other historian who has met them there either. It's not surprising then that claims made in their emotive and often melodramatic pieces in the press are continually found to be either inaccurate or completely invented. To have an honest and fair reassessment of our history, which is what we need about this time period, we first need to overcome the hesitancy and the fear that there is about debating, celebrating and commemorating this period in Irish history. The claim was repeatedly made that the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1966 sparked the more recent conflict in the North. And this was used as an excuse not to celebrate and celebrate is what we should be doing, not to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1991. Already there have been calls by some people for a very muted celebration of the centenary of the 1916 Rising in 2016. 
But for anyone to believe this idea that the commemorating this sparked the trouble in the North would first have to believe that Northern Ireland 40 years ago was a perfectly just and fair society, which obviously it wasn't. The conflict sparked in the North had a lot more to do with events in Alabama and Mississippi and the civil rights movement there, and a lot less to do with de Valera standing on a platform outside the GPO. Now, unfortunately, many heritage sites and museums still tend to skip over the period of the revolution. There seems to be a fear that any mention of this period will be controversial or will cause offence. Now, I've worked in the Heritage Service in, for both the public, uh, state-run one, and uh, in private aspects of the Heritage Service for 10 years. And I can tell you that visitors from Britain, regardless of whether they have been to Ireland before or whether they have Irish ancestry or not, are very interested in this period, want to know more about it, and do not find it offensive. Because let's be honest, it's part of their history as well. Um, now, Kilmainham Jail remains one of the most popular heritage sites in Ireland, not just with Irish people, but with people from around the world. And I think that proves to an extent what I'm saying. It is shocking to think that for years, unimaginative government ministers refused calls to turn that place into a museum, and it's now one of our number one visitor attractions. Meanwhile, it was used to store electrical equipment for Siemens, the German, uh, the German electrical company. And at one stage, there was even a proposal, which was almost passed, to demolish part of the prison so that they could increase the storage space. Uh, by now, we should have learned that there is huge tourism and heritage potential in developing sites associated with the history of the revolution. But sadly, historic sites such as Number 16 Moore Street are still under threat of destruction today. In the boom years of the Celtic Tiger, we were told that we no longer needed history. Why not? The past, was, we were told, was irrelevant, because the era of boom and bust was over. We were all going to live in the present, in which we were wealthy and successful. That was going to be the future, and it would continue on forever. But during the boom years, we seemed eager to disown our history as well, and to accept without a demur its rewriting by others. Those who tried to defend our heritage were often chastised for standing in the way of progress. Now that same progress was measured solely in terms of profit, rather than how close we came towards realising the aspirations and the hopes of those who fought so hard and sacrificed so much in the hope that future generations like us would enjoy the fruits of their labour. When we look at the writings of one of the leaders of that generation, Liam Mellows, it is not hard to see how far we have fallen away for what that generation fought for. Mello stated, quote, we do not seek to make this country a materially great country at the expense of its honour. We would rather have this country poor and indignant. We would rather have the people of Ireland eking out a poor existence on the soil, as long as they possess their souls, their minds and their honour. If we know our history, then it can help us put into context the difficulties that we face at present. The people of Ireland have survived famine, oppression and civil war. Recession and debt pale insignificantly in comparison to those. People seeking change, marginalised groups, the exploited, the downtrodden, the oppressed have always looked and drawn on history as a source of courage, inspiration and identity. And if people are disconnected from our history, if it is downgraded in the education system, if it is watered down out of ignorance or for political ends, then we, then people will be left unaware that they come from a proud heritage and that they are not powerless to effect change. And that, I think, is what we need to remember in the next decade. So with that, the book is launched. Gormil Magif, thank you very much.